Would you please now turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 10. We're in this section in which Jesus is giving the commission to the disciples, to the 12 apostles, uh, in their mission to Israel. And we looked at Matthew 10, 1 through 15 last Sunday. Today we are going to be looking at verses 16 to 31. So please give your attention to the reading of God's word. Matthew 10, verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered Proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Thus far, the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let's now pray and ask his blessing upon the preaching of his word. Lord, we have read this portion of holy scripture, the, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, his teaching uh, to the disciples to prepare them for persecution. And so we ask, O oh Lord, that you would use these words and by your spirit cause us to to hear what our Lord has to say, that we might follow him, knowing that there is great cost, knowing that persecution may very well happen to us, but yet trusting in his comfort and his grace and his protection. This we ask in Christ's name, amen. Until recently, uh, in the United States of America, we have had tremendous religious freedom. Christians have been free to worship the Lord, to preach the gospel, and to, to be Christians, uh, even in some degree in the public square to some extent. And this has been something that we've experienced for many, many years uh, in this country. But in historical perspective, that kind of religious freedom is actually an anomaly. And not only in historical perspective, even now, in geographical perspective, there are many other parts of the world where people do not have religious freedom. There are many other parts of the world where Christians are persecuted. I just saw in the news that there was another attack of, you know, Boko Haram in Nigeria or Uganda somewhere was, you know, going into a Christian school and shooting up uh, Christians there in Uganda. And this is going on around the world. There are Christians around the world who are suffering persecution, who do not have religious freedom, or it's not easy to be a Christian. Being a Christian is difficult. 
it could be very costly. I believe that when we look at what's going on in our culture today, that this tremendous religious freedom that we have been experiencing in America for many years is beginning to change. And although we're not yet experiencing terrorists coming and shooting up churches, uh, we have difficulties. There, it's hard to be a Christian in this country now. Things are beginning to change. There is marginalization. There is the possibility of losing your job uh, if you don't go along with the reigning orthodoxy on certain issues. And so, we need to prepare for the possibility of persecution. And this passage before us in Matthew 10 provides us with our Lord's teaching on how to prepare for that possibility. Now, in the context, in Matthew 10, verses 1 through 15, which we looked at last week, the context is very specific and particular, dealing with this mission to Israel that Jesus is sending the disciples on. He's sending out the 12, he calls the 12 disciples, and he commissions them, he gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease. And he tells them in verse five, don't go among the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans who are equivalent to Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as a sign of the presence of the kingdom, do exactly what I did. Jesus himself did the same thing. He proclaimed the kingdom and he also healed the sick. And so he says to the disciples that they now have the authority to do what he did in his name. And so in the context, it's a very specific uh, set of instructions for a very specific time that is now past. We are not doing this mission to Israel anymore. This is not, now it doesn't mean we shouldn't preach the gospel to Jews, but this specific historical mission to Israel has been brought to an end. It has been fulfilled and the church has been established through Christ's death and resurrection. And so it is easy to dismiss this whole chapter and say, well, therefore all of this is just for that time, for the, for the 12 apostles at that time in this particular moment prior to the resurrection of Christ. And so therefore, it doesn't apply to us and we don't need to benefit from this portion of God's word. But that would be a mistake. Because even in the process of giving these instructions that are very detailed and specific, you know, all these things about, you know, don't take any money with you in your belt. Uh, don't take two tunics or sandals. Uh, this is in verses 9 and 10. Um, all these details, um, they are no longer to be done today. That's not we're, we're not commanded to, to, to observe those rules now because this particular mission has been fulfilled. But in the midst of giving these details and these specific instructions, Jesus looks ahead to the Great Commission after the resurrection. And he gives some teaching in this section that goes beyond the immediate historical circumstance of this mission to Israel. And so there is much teaching in this section that does apply to us and that we can use and that we can be encouraged by. In fact, we can tell this because if you look in, in our text in verses 17 to 18, Jesus is clearly looking ahead to the mission as it would be continued after the resurrection and as it would be changed into the Great Commission to the nations. He says in verse 17, beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. He mentions the Gentiles there, right? So even though initially he said, don't go to the Gentiles back in verse five, you can tell that he is in the midst of this teaching that is very specific for this mission to Israel, he's also looking ahead to the Great Commission to the Gentiles after the resurrection. The teaching of Jesus in this section is not then limited only to the mission to Israel, but it contains principles and durable instructions that will apply to the Great Commission of the Apostles after the resurrection and ascension of Christ. We didn't read it, but uh, the very next verse after where we ended, we ended in verse 31, but in the very next verse, verse 32, 
we see an example again of this idea of broadening the instruction to where now it's not just even to the apostles, but to all believers, right? He says, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. That is a general teaching that doesn't just apply to apostles or ministers or missionaries, but to all of God's people. And so what is the main thing that Jesus is trying to communicate here in this section, in verses 16 to 31? What is the main thing he's trying to communicate to us? He's trying to communicate that we should not be surprised by persecution, but rather we should expect it. And therefore, since we should not be surprised by it, but should expect it, that means that we need to prepare for it before it comes. We need to be alert to the spiritual forces that are at work. That's why he begins this section in verse 16. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents. Be wise, be discerning, be, be spiritually alert and, and aware of the fact that there is a spiritual battle out there. Don't be naive. Now, be innocent as doves. Show the love of Christ and be compassionate and loving to all people. But at the same time, have that wisdom. Have that preparation. Don't be naive. Don't assume that everyone is going to love you and like you. And when they do hate you, when they do turn against you, don't take it personally. The world has an allergic reaction, but it's not against you. It's against Christ. And Jesus is saying here that if the powers of darkness who used the Jewish leaders and the Roman officials uh, to persecute Christ, they nailed him to a cross, don't be surprised if those in positions of authority after the death of Christ continue to reject and persecute the followers of Christ. Jesus is saying here, when he says be wise as serpents, he's alluding to this idea that serpents are viewed as being wise creatures, as having discernment. And so he's saying you, should, you need to have wisdom. It takes spiritual wisdom and spiritual insight and discernment to get ready for persecution and to recognize that the battle is waged at a spiritual level. And so to help the disciples prepare for persecution, Jesus makes three points to make them wise, to give them this wisdom, this wisdom as serpents. First, he says, consider persecution as an opportunity for witness. Secondly, he says, understand the reason for persecution. And thirdly, be confident in God's spiritual protection in the midst of persecution. So first, consider persecution as an opportunity for witness. That's the essence of what he's saying there in verses 18 to 20. You'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake. That's the persecution part of it. But why? It's to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. This is so contrary to our immediate response to persecution. When we're being treated badly, we're being marginalized, we're being harmed and oppressed and persecuted, we feel, we, we, we tend to take it personally and we feel hurt and we feel defensive and we, we feel sorry for ourselves because we're being mistreated. And Jesus is trying to teach the disciples and by implication to teach all of his followers, all of us even now, 2,000 years later, that we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't react in that way of just feeling sorry for ourselves and oh me, oh my, how come I'm being hurt and mistreated? This isn't fair. Instead, we should seize the opportunity for witness. This is why the Lord is allowing this to happen so that we can bear witness to Christ before the world. He says in verse 19, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your Father speaking through you. Now, I believe that this particular verse here is a little bit more specific and referring to the apostles. Uh, I don't think that we as Christians today, 2,000 years later, should expect special revelation like this of the Holy Spirit telling us what to say when we're on trial or when we're having uh, our moment of persecution and witness. This is probably referring to 
what we see when you look in the book of Acts. Jesus here is already looking ahead to the gift of the Spirit at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And as a result of the outpouring of the Spirit, the apostles fearlessly bore witness before the people of Israel. In the time of their ministry before his resurrection, the apostles were the opposite of that, right? They had no boldness. They were afraid. Peter even denied the Lord three times. He was afraid he was going to get arrested too. All the other disciples fled when Jesus was arrested. But all of that changed after the resurrection and after the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. These weak men were suddenly made strong and became fearless witnesses to Jesus Christ. We see a great example of this in Acts chapter 2, where the Jewish leadership commanded the apostles, for, they forbade them and said, you may not publicly speak and preach about Christ uh, in the temple precincts and in the city of Jerusalem. But they said, we have to obey God rather than men. And in Acts chapter 4, it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and this is what he preached. He preached that this Jesus is the stone that has been rejected by you, the builders, and it has now become the cornerstone. Listen to how bold he is in saying this, this great truth of the gospel. And there is no salvation in anyone else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. And immediately, what happened? The people, the Jewish leadership, they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated, common men, and they were astonished because the Holy Spirit had given them the words to say in that hour. They were timid and fearful before, but now they are bold and fearless. And the thing that made the difference was the resurrection of Jesus and the gift of the Spirit at Pentecost that completely transformed these men. It gave them a supernatural courage so that they were enabled to stand up and bear witness to Christ even though it was at the cost of their own imprisonment and persecution and even in spite of the raging opposition of the Jewish authorities. But here's the key. It was precisely this opposition and persecution that provided them the opportunity to bear witness to the world and to bear witness to the power of the resurrection of Christ and Christ living in them by his spirit. Jesus has ascended into heaven, and so the world does not see Jesus. But the world does see his people, his servants, you and I on this earth. The world can see the boldness and the transformed lives of the servants of Christ and the followers of Christ. And that then is part of the God-ordained providential ordering of things that through this conflict, through this persecution, we would be able to bear witness to the reality of Christ. Christ is made real to the eyes of unbelievers when they see our changed lives and they see how bold we are because of Christ and his resurrection power living in us by his spirit. So that's the first thing that Jesus is trying to encourage us with. To prepare for persecution, it really does help if you have sort of a, uh, a change of heart, a change of mind. It's like you're, you're flipping it upside down. Instead of taking the persecution as a chance to feel sorry for yourself about how hurt you are, flip it around as an opportunity for witness. This is an opportunity to share Christ and to, be, uh, to bear witness to the power of Christ in the world. That's why Tertullian said, his famous quote, you've probably all heard, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Remember in the first few centuries of the church, Christianity was an illegal religion and the Roman Empire persecuted Christians. And many Christians, including uh, you know, all the martyrs of the, of the early church, they paid for it with their lives. And yet, in spite of their blood being shed, God used that to transform the Roman Empire to bring many to faith in Christ. The blood of the martyrs was the seed that was planted. The, their blood was spilled into the ground and then that became the seed that sprouted up and many people came to know the Lord because of their fearless witness. Now there's a second thing that Jesus wants us to understand and this is really crucial 
The second thing that we need to understand as we prepare for persecution is we need to understand the reason for persecution. Verse 21, brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all, notice this key phrase, for my name's sake. That is the key. You will be hated for all for my name's sake. Uh, this is actually very similar to another phrase that was used a little bit earlier back in verse 18, where it says that you'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake. This is the reason for persecution. It's because of our identification with Christ and his gospel. They're persecuting us because they hate Christ and the gospel of Christ. They're not persecuting you because they hate you. They don't hate you per se. They hate Christ and they hate you because you represent Christ, because you stand for Christ, because you proclaim the gospel of Christ. Remember again, I've made this point many times, but just keep going back to this basic thought. What was it that Jesus sent the disciples to do? The great commission or the, the mission to Israel that's here in our text is that they are to do two things, to preach the gospel of the kingdom and to add to that the attesting signs of healing and casting out demons to show the reality of the kingdom. And those two things, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and doing miracles and healings and casting out demons as the sign of the coming of the kingdom is exactly what Jesus did, right? Jesus himself, back in chapter 9, verse 35, he went throughout all the villages and so on, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And so when the disciples are sent out on this initial mission to Israel, and then later on that will turn into the Great Commission to all the nations, when the disciples are sent out in this mission to Israel, doing those exact same two things, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing the sick as the sign of the kingdom, they are standing in for Christ. They represent Christ. The disciples themselves, they're nothing. They're just fishermen. They're, they're, they're weak and ignorant men, right? They're sinners. But because they've been appointed by Christ and granted Christ's authority, Chapter 10, verse 1, he gave them authority over unclean spirits. They represent Christ. And so they're being persecuted now. The fact that they're going to get ready to be persecuted is only because of their connection to Christ, because they stand for Christ, because they are. It's almost as if they represent the real presence of Christ through their ministry. Christ himself is being, he's amplifying with a megaphone the power of his preaching and teaching and healing ministry by sending out the 12 in order to do what he did. And so that's the, the important thing we need to learn. The reason why we are persecuted is because of our identification with Christ. They will hate you for my name's sake. Why is the gospel so offensive to the world? Well, we can see right here in the gospel itself, as we've been reading through Matthew 8, 9, and 10, we can see what is offensive about the gospel. Why do the Pharisees constantly come around and criticize Jesus? It's because he came to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's because he ate and drank with tax collectors and sinners. It's because he said, I have the authority to forgive sins. And they grumbled and said, who can forgive sins but God alone? The gospel is offensive because it means that there is none who is righteous. And the world doesn't want to hear that. Now, that's kind of paradoxical, right? Because when we think about, like for example, in our present circumstance of what's going on in our culture right now, it seems like it's just the opposite. It seems like, well, the world hates us because we're pointing out that they're sinners. We're pointing out that they are um, that they're going against God's law. And so it seems like the offense of the gospel has to do with the law, not with the gospel. But the reality is, is that it has to do with the gospel. The gospel is offensive because it says only Christ is righteous. You know, one way to think about the world 
And this applies in so many different situations and contexts and cultures. It applies to the situation with Jesus and his conflict with the Pharisees in the first century. It applies throughout church history. It applies today in our context. One way to think about the world, the world which is arrayed against Christ and the gospel, is one big righteousness machine. Everything that the world does is intended to give people a feeling that they are righteous. People want to be righteous. Nobody wants to think of themselves as being a bad person, right? Everyone wants to think of themselves as being a good person. And so there, it changes from culture to culture and age to age about what exactly the mechanism of the machine is, what exactly it is that gets you brownie points in that system. Right now, what gets you brownie points is tolerance for all kinds of sexual perversion, right? That's, that's the main thing that gets you brownie, brownie points, is if you stand for that, then you are tolerant and you are righteous. And it's those bad Christians who are the, the bad people because they're being so critical. But the world is one big righteousness machine. That's what the world is trying to do, is to create a sense of righteousness. I am righteous because of my good works. I'm righteous because of how good I am at being a tolerant person towards all of these uh, identities in the world around us. That then means that the gospel is an offense because the gospel takes, a, takes a, an ax and just goes to the root of that whole righteousness machine and just destroys it and says there is none righteous. The only way you can be righteous is not by anything that you do, it's not by having the right political opinions, it's not by your activism, it's not by worshiping, you know, if we go back to the first century, it's not by worshiping the Roman gods and defending the Roman Empire. It's not, if you go back to the time of the Pharisees, it's not by being zealous to keep the Torah and all of its details and all of the traditions of man. That's not where righteousness comes from. Your righteousness machine is broken. Righteousness only comes from Christ and what he has done. Righteousness is only found in Christ. And the only one who can receive that righteousness and thus be righteous in the sight of God is the one who says, Lord, I admit that I'm not righteous. I know that I'm not righteous, and I know I need your grace and your forgiveness. And Jesus makes this so clear, doesn't he? Go back to Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. When Jesus was reclining at the table with tax collectors and sinners, the Pharisees saw this, and they said, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Right, because that's a very bad thing. If you eat with tax collectors and sinners, you're going to be defiled and impure by their impurity and sin. And what does Jesus say? He preaches the gospel to these to these men who are using the law and the oral traditions as their righteousness machine. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That is not all the keeping of the minutia of the oral traditions of man. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous. I came not to call those who think they're righteous, but sinners. He came to call sinners. He came to welcome sinners to his table. Only those who humble themselves and admit that they're not righteous and know that they need the righteousness of Christ are welcome at his table. So understand the reason for persecution. It's not because they don't like you personally. It's not because of something that you said. It's not because of your the way you dress or the kind of music you like. It's not because of anything outward and cultural like that. It is because of your identification with Christ and his gospel of free grace. Oh, by the way, I should just mention this one really neat thing in our text. We didn't talk about it last week. I skipped over it. But did you notice verse 8? Verse 8, after the part about healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, verse 8b there's a great statement of the gospel right there embedded in our text. It says, you received without paying, Jesus talking to the disciples, you received the grace of the gospel and the, the reality of the kingdom of salvation. You received without paying, give without pay. And the word that is used there, without paying, is the same word that is used by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 when he says that we're justified freely as a gift. It's the exact same word in Greek. 
Another way to translate it is the, uh, I was quoting from the ESV, but the NASB uh, is even better here. It says, freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received the grace of the gospel, the presence of the kingdom, and all the healing power of Christ and forgiveness of sins and coming to his table. Freely you have received, so freely give. Go out and preach the gospel to others. Freely you have received, freely give. By grace you have received, by grace give. That is what makes the gospel offensive. So the first thing that Jesus wants the disciples to know is that uh, they should consider persecution as an opportunity. Flip it upside down and don't get sorry for yourself, but think of it as an opportunity to bear witness to Christ. Secondly, understand the true underlying reason why the world hates us. And then third, he says, be confident in God's spiritual protection during persecution. And that's the, the last part that we read there, verses 26 through 31. Be confident in the Lord's spiritual protection of his own in the midst of persecution. The downside of persecution is persecution, right? It's the pain and the suffering and losing everything for the sake of Christ. But the upside is, is that why were we persecuted? It was because of our identification with Christ, and so therefore, because we're identified with him, we belong to him. We belong to him, body and soul, in life and in death, and so he will cover us with his spiritual protection. And so, we don't need to be ultimately afraid. Yes, there is fear at the earthly level. We're afraid of losing our job. We're afraid of suffering the social marginalization. We're afraid possibly even of dying. And that's natural to be afraid. But we don't need to be afraid in the ultimate sense because we have Christ and we belong to Christ. This passage here about don't fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul is so encouraging and so wonderful. This powerful passage shows us that we are composed of two parts, a body and a soul, and that the soul can survive the death of the body. Isn't that an amazing thing? The soul can survive the death of the body. And for those who belong to Christ, our souls are taken into his immediate presence. What a powerful passage this is, showing us his care and protection for us. Now, of course, we have no promise from Christ of being protected from physical harm, Christ does not promise us that we will never suffer. Christ does not promise us that we will never suffer uh, want or suffer difficulty or possibly even death. But we can know that we have ultimate spiritual protection in Christ. The enemy can kill our body, but they cannot kill our soul. Our souls are safe in his hand. That's why Jesus says, fear not. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Sparrows are the seemingly least significant of all of the creatures out there, right? So small, very cheap, you can buy them for a penny, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. When Jesus says, fear not, it's easy to misunderstand that because grammatically it's in the form of a command, right? Fear not, don't do that. But it's not a command, it's not a law. In its practical effect, it's not a command, but a word of comfort. Jesus wants to give the disciples strength to endure, to continue to confess him in spite of the world's hostility and scorn. And so he encourages the disciples. He encourages us, too. Fear not. Fear not, my little flock. Fear not. I'm with you. I've got you. You're protected. You're in my hand, regardless of what may happen. Even your body, regardless of all of that, what may happen to your body, you are safe in my hand. And if we then have that confidence that we are protected by him in that ultimate spiritual sense, then that gives us the strength to carry on. That gives us the strength to stand up in bold witness for our Lord Jesus Christ. As I mentioned at the beginning, <clears throat> I do think that 
things are changing in our culture. And I'm not claiming that I think that this is the end times, right? I mean, when the early church was persecuted and they were going through the fires of terrible persecution, I'm sure that they thought that that was the end days, that was the end time. So we don't know for sure if Christ is coming back within our lifetime. It seems like these things go through cycles, right? There are times when the, the church has greater degree of freedom and influence in the culture, and then there's times when things go into a darker valley where we have to brace ourselves for persecution. So I don't know if we are living in the last days. But we do see something happening in our culture right now where the civil arena is becoming more and more intolerant of Christians. We see hatred of Christianity, not just uh, it's not simply a defense of their lifestyles. It's also a hatred of Christianity. And so it's very helpful to study these portions of God's word, such as Matthew chapter 10, in order to prepare ourselves for what may be coming. Maybe it will turn out to be nothing. Maybe it will change in some other way. And things, these things have a way of morphing and changing and evolving. So who knows what it will be like in 10 years from now. But it's still beneficial and helpful to prepare ourselves and to think and to be ready. And also to know that this is ultimately a spiritual battle. And so even if it doesn't lead to some really terrible persecution like in the first century where there's actual martyrdoms happening, even if it doesn't lead to that, there's still a spiritual battle that is raging. And so we need to take the Lord's words to heart and be encouraged by them so that we might be prepared to be bold witnesses for Christ in the world around us. But let's make sure, this is an important point, let's make sure that our witness is a witness for Christ. Make sure that when we are persecuted and marginalized, that it's for the gospel of Christ and not for something else that would detract from the, the message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray.